Right, why are we here? Here's some guaranteed excitement. <gasps> oh, there's our friend, friend uh, Terry Adlam bottom there. I think it could best be described as a, as a sort of 17th century romp. That's always good advice. Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah, really good fun. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson, Richard James and Chris Dale. Back again. I said we're back again. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we're I in the room. Distracted. We're doing the podcast. <sighs> podcast. Chris and I are here. Yep. For the Jerry Anderson podcast. Right. Chris Dale, Richard James. Am I doing it? Yes, and you are? Jamie Anderson. Right. Why are we here? To talk about Jerry Anderson. Right. What do we're going to do? Yeah. Including news. Right. Interview. Yeah. Randomizer. Randomizer. Yeah. And also, I think it's the only place in the world, in the universe, yeah. where three <laughs> people sit around and draw parallels between UFO and Four Feather Falls. That's, that's true, right. yes. which is what happened last week. That's true, that's right. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. All that's still to come. Uh, but first, I think it's time for some very exciting Jerry Anderson news. Oh, yes. Can, can we guarantee excitement? Go on. Do yeah. that. Here's some guaranteed excitement. <gasps> I mean, you've set the bar pretty high there, haven't you? Uh, Guaranteed excitement. Excitement by volume, if not by intensity. Oh, you're talking quantity, oh. not quality. I am today, possibly, yes. <laughs> Let's hear it then. Uh, well, should we ta- start with collectibles or events? Oh, collectibles, Ooh. please. Oh, OK. Well, yeah. uh, Stingray's 60th anniversary. Yes. So coming very soon. I think for pre-order, pre-order at the end of this month yeah. is a Stingray Wasp sidearm. Ah. Oh. So that's not it that Chris is holding up there. This, this is, is a Captain Scarlet sign. Yeah, so there have previously been an international rescue ray gun, as I think they called it on the packaging, and uh, this uh, Spectrum one, be careful with it. Yes. Uh, but now, for I think the first time since there was a water pistol version of it, maybe in the 60s. <laughs> right. Yeah, of course there was. Uh, is a, a screen accurate Ooh, human yes. scale replica Gosh. wasp sidearm, and it looks beautiful. Yeah. Lovely packaging. Uh, Limited edition of 500 units. Yeah, comes with its own stand. Comes with its own stand, which I hasten to add does not match the stand from the previous ones because <laughs> they were made by a different company, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Okay. But same scale and yeah. it will look lovely uh, on the shelf next to them. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Such a weird design. Yeah, as well. right. So kind of long and thin and not sure where the trigger is and not sure what anything does, but it looks cool. It's mm. very 60s. So, I'm looking forward to that. Are there any sort of difficulties in producing replica sidearms? In terms of, you know, producing replica sidearms. <laughs> Is in the design or, or shipping them because they're sidearms? Yes, that. That's both things. Yeah, both okay. those things then. Uh, well, and the answer is no. Chris Thompson designs them, mm-hmm. does a nice CG build, yeah. sends the files over to the factory, they do a couple of prototypes, we go, yeah. oh, that doesn't work, let's change that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, that's a faff, and then we get them over. Yeah. So, the, the less it looks like a real gun, right. the easier it is to ship, gotcha. and that doesn't look anything like a real no. gun. That's... It looks like a medical implement, or possibly somewhere you might <laughs> yes. buy in a you know shop with covered windows. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, no. it's, it's you strange. and anything you see on the internet. Yes. Ignore it. That's always good advice. Okay, great. Uh, So yes, that'll be available for pre-order soon. But also in our collectibles range, our expanding range of eagles is the VIP eagle, the lovely (laughs) tangerine eagle, Yes, I think that's fair to say, Uh, from the first episode. Yeah, only seen transporting Simmons. Yep. Um, Nice thing. Yeah, Mm -hmm. lovely. Uh, And also available, I think, for pre-order at the end of June, arriving end of July. Wonderful. Very nice. So how many eagles are there available now? By the Jams and store, and well, I guess they've Eagle, been gone, Eagle they? One sold out. Yeah. The Rescue Eagle is probably by now sold out. Right. So, yes, it, it'll be just the Rescue. So, yeah. if you want to add, add that to your collection or start a new collection of Eagles with the Rescue, why, yeah. uh, with the VIP, why not? Mm-hmm. Or uh, buy a VIP and paint over it with white paint. Then you'll have your own regular Eagle. Chris, we're not, um, oh, we're not suggesting people no, do that. It's called customizing, it's very popular. People do? Buy oh, something yeah. and then turn it into something else. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fine. Or you can get your sister to vomit over it when you go on holiday. And if you're not sure about that story, please go back to <laughs> pod 11. Yeah, that's that, that very requires a days. footnote, yeah. <laughs> that's right, yes. Yeah, there you go. There's some collectibles news. Great. Right. What events? About, uh, events news? Yeah. Well, there's a screening Ooh. festival thing. Right. Thing. South End. Oh, yeah. Let me just... South End Sea Film Festival, I think. I think that's right, that's yes. Right. Yeah, Peter Littman will be pleased. Uh, yes, he will be uh, on the 5th of June. Okay, not so very far away. So, no, very, very uh, close by. Mm-hmm. 
That's and a then, Wednesday, isn't it? It is a Wednesday. Oh, and also another one on Sunday the 9th. <gasps> okay. Gosh. Where they're showing Dick Spanner in HD. Okay, lovely. lovely. And I believe dear old Terry Adlam is turning up. Goodness oh. me. Well, don't worry about that. He'll he still go. Envelope, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can go meet Terry. He's always very happy to speak to people, and he's very lovely as yeah. well. So yeah. there you go. That'd be jolly. Yeah. And then Thunderbirds and Co. Oh, yes. The event at Colchester yes, Castle. Yes, still going on, is it? Running until the 30th of June. So you've got just over a month mm. left if you want to go and visit that. Uh, focuses quite a lot on the archive of Joy Laurie, but also mm-hmm. covers all sorts of sci-fi stuff. Yes, a few of our Potsterons have been posting pictures on our uh, Facebook group. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. Students. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. it's lovely. Thank you. Mm. Uh, and phones. Yes. Phones. If there's any phones Yay. left yeah. in the store, then you can get 25% off yeah. with the oh. code OKTROY. Yep, yeah, that's at shop.jerryanderson.com. Well done, Richard QVC James. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you have to know where to find it. Yeah, I know. I, I was making the assumption, but that was foolish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Is that enough? I think that'll do for this week, won't it? Was that exciting by volume, if not by quality? I should cocoa. Good. Well done, you. <laughs> then that's the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. That was the news. Do you see how I'm delegating? It's brilliant. That's, yes. that's the, the, one of the key things about... You uh, delegate with a look now. You don't even have to <laughs> say yeah. anything. That's how powerful I, I am. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, talking of powerful things, <laughs> Another one of your segues, yes. Would yes. you like to see how the powerful Chris Dale got on the second part of his interview? Ah, uh, yes. Tell us more about who you're talking to, Chris. Well, I'm talking to Gary Tompkins, who was the art director on Terror Hawks yeah. back in the 1980s. From there, he went on to lots of other films uh, and is now working on such things as Harry Potter films, Star Wars films, Amazing. and just films, big films. He's won awards. He's a very busy man, but he came here. Because he had a free day. Oh, let's have a look. And we're very grateful. <laughs> so, Gary, welcome back to the Jerry Anderson podcast. You enjoyed Thank it you. so much last week. You're back for more again. <laughs> so, going back to your earlier Anderson memories, um, obviously, we've talked about Thunderbirds. Um, what is is Thunderbirds the absolute earliest you can remember, or is there anything before that? I remember Stingray. Mm-hmm. But the tricky thing is, of course, one never knows whether they're repeated shows that I saw yeah. later. But certainly remember um, Stingray, Thunderbirds. I don't remember many of the black and white ones. No. I think that's probably my cutoff. I think I'm not quite old enough to remember well, You them. did very well on the black and white <laughs> ones with uh, Super well, Identification yes, yeah. last week, yes. So any memories of um, the, the live action ones of UFO in 1999? Were you watching Yeah, those always used time? to watch yeah. all of those. Um, I haven't watched them for many years, so don't ask me any questions. But <laughs> but no, they were always a favourite. And, and, you know, like I'm sure so many people say, it's it, it was the, the Derek Meddings miniatures and the, the yeah. UFO. And again, the dinky toys, the oh, UFO yes. and the, f- the firing missile and yeah. the curiously coloured green yeah. machine instead of white. Mm. Got a lovely white one. Oh, on a nice white I'm one looking, here. Looking very missile, jealously yes. at that one. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lovely pro- product enterprise. It's 1612 one, yes. <laughs> so you had all of the toys, mm. most of the toys. Um, did we have a favourite series from, from that era, the 60s and 70s? It, I, I, I know, it's like probably everyone's, but Thunderbirds. Yeah. Definitely. I've, like I say, because it hit me at the right age, mm. because it was just the right combination of um, fun. I think, you know, the latter ones, they... They were great, got a little bit more serious, Space 1999 UFO. But at that precise age that I hit, that I saw Thunderbirds in combination with the toys that you would be playing with on the carpet as you were watching it on the TV. Mm. Yeah, that, that's definitely my favourite, I think. So what else were you watching around that time that was having a similar impact on you? Oh, my goodness. That's quite hard to know. I mean, the, the usual sort of Blue Peter and stuff oh. like that. So nothing that really came close to Thunderbirds no, in that sense. That, that, that no, that's definitely the, definitely the one. So were you watching? You, presumably you were watching every week. You had, you say, yeah. you had your toys there. Yep. This yep, was definitely. appointment viewing as Absolutely. such. Absolutely, Thunderbirds yep. as a kid. Back yeah. in the day when uh, you know, there were no such thing as video recorders or no. streaming, or you watched it. Once <laughs> you had to watch it then, that was it or forever. you wouldn't, you wouldn't see it. Yeah, again, there was so, no yeah. chance of it being shown ever again. <laughs> and here we are, fifty years later, still talking about it all. <laughs> So when you're watching that as a kid, were you th- even thinking back then, oh, I'd like to do something similar to this? Or did that come along yeah, later? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I, my father was an art director in the film industry, as was my uncle. So I always had a, a kind of inkling that that's the sort of thing I'd like to do. And as someone that loved model railways and airfix kits and all of that stuff that every kid loves, I suppose, um, to think that you could actually 
use those skills and, and drawing skills for a job, it's like, well, why, why wouldn't I? And, you know, I could always saw my dad making card models and, and doing lovely drawings of stuff. And it's like, well, I quite like to do that as a job. So I think from an early age, I, I thought, you know, that's, that's the route I'd like to take. Because, you know, back then there wasn't really an awareness that such jobs existed. Mm. Nowadays there are, you know, with the advent of DVD extras and documentaries and YouTube and what have you and, and behind the scenes books and, of course, lots of fantastic film and TV design courses in universities, colleges up and down the country, there's a much bigger awareness. Even things like the Harry Potter tour at Leavesden, people can see behind the scenes and there's an awareness that, hey, I could do this for a job. But back then, back in you know late 70s, early 80s, it wasn't really something that people thought about doing unless yeah. perhaps you had a, a member of the family in it. So how did you make that leap from, from watching the stuff on TV to actually doing it for real? Because your first professional job was not working on Terror Hawks. You worked on a, another 1980s cult classic, which is... Crowl. Crowl. Yes. We all love Crowl, don't we? Yes, yes. Oh. That, was a, that was a great film. That, uh, so I, I, I went to college back in those days. There were no, like I say, no film and TV design courses. So I did an, an interior design and architectural design course. Went in on Crowl, started making cups of tea, doing prints, all the stuff that you always do in the first, first few months, I was going to say years in the film industry. And I was lucky enough to do some drawings. There was a big, big white castle in that. And I did some details of that, some doors and some windows for the castle. Made a lovely white car model of the, the Kroll castle. And um, it's like, yeah, this is, this is great. <laughs> so were you thinking at that point, this is a novelty, a one-off, or, oh, I'd like to stay in this world? And, and I think I such. thought that was, that was the route that I was definitely going to yeah. pursue for the rest of my life <laughs> so how did you get from from there to to terror hawks was it uh after after Krull, i did another very different film low budget film with a director called michael winner mm -hmm. uh called the wicked lady which starred faye dunaway and alan bates and john gielgud and lots of kind of 70s actors yeah. it, i think it could best be described as a as a sort of 17th century romp ah i think <laughs> it's, that's a that's, it covers a multitude of sins. Yes. When, um, don't anyone rush out and, and view it. No. I don't recommend it. Probably but, you know, it was, it was, again, it was a lovely thing. Very mm -hmm. different. Crawl was a big studio-based film. Lots of big set builds. Wicked Lady, all locations in country houses and various little, you know, villages. And very small crew. And I was, you know, part of that crew and had to stand around and be the, the sort of whipping boy on the set for the art, art department. And uh, that, 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 was, that was a good experience. And then, like I say, I had a phone call from Bob Bell saying, I want to do this thing called Terror Hawks. So, so it's, all, it's all good experience, isn't it? It's, it's all, all good experience. And that, that's the thing about the film industry. Every job is different. Mm. Whether you're working on you know, a big sci-fi epic or whether you're working on a, a period drama, it, it's no, no two days are the same. No two jobs are the same. And that, that's the joy of it, really, for me. Yeah. Let's dig into our tin of listener questions. Uh -oh. Here we have three <coughs> left. I don't know if you want to take all three now or okay. do two and save one till oh, the let's end. Let's take all three. And yeah, go for it. Saves. Thank you. So, this is from Becca Moore. Are there any projects that you really wanted to work on but didn't come your way? Ooh. That's a good question. Another good question. They're all good questions. Yeah. Um, That's what our pod I've, are I've been so, so lucky that I've worked on uh, the Harry Potter franchise. I've worked on Star Wars. Mm. Um, what I always say is one of my claims to fame is, apart from Anthony Daniels, I think I'm the only person who have worked on all three incarnations of Star Wars. So I did work experience on The Empire Strikes Back. Oh, right. I then worked on The Phantom Menace for the prequels. I then did Force Awakens, Rogue One and Solo in the latter years. So nice. that was... Really fortunate to work on so many of those Star Wars films. And the Potter franchise is fantastic. I loved working on those. The one thing I haven't ever done, and it's partly due to timing because I haven't been available or haven't been asked, is a Bond film. Oh, yes. And, you know, that of all the big kind of IPs out there, Bond, I think, is, is another yeah. one, you know, Star Wars, Potter, Bond... It's the one that's kind of... I have a chat to slip back about that. Well, exactly. Yes. <laughs> what, what's he playing at? <clears throat> 
to the next question, <clears throat> Jonathan Bell. What was it like working with Steven Spielberg on the movie War Horse? Oh, when would that have been? Uh, that was in about 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was terrific because I just finished working on the Harry Potter films, which lots of lovely Gothic architecture on the castles and that sort of thing. And then suddenly I'm put in working on this film called War Horse set in the first world war. So having been an expert on Gothic architecture, suddenly you have to be an expert on world war one tanks and how world war one trenches were constructed and all that kind of stuff. Um, so did lots of research, went down to the tank museum in Bovington and measured up the tank there. We built a full size tank. We had lots of lovely locations down in Dartmoor and Spielberg was wonderful. He was, you know, initially you're kind of in awe of him. It's like, oh my God, it's Steven Spielberg. It's like, but then after a few, a few days, actually, he's just one of the, the filmmakers. Mm. You're all there in a muddy field. And believe me, there was a lot of mud on that movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of mud on that movie. And he, he was terrific. He, you know, he, he absolutely knew what a professional, knew exactly what he wanted, where the shot was, um... He, he made life kind of easy for us, really. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, he, he, he hasn't got the reputation for being one of the greatest directors for no reason. He really... The, the only awkward moment I had with him was I was... I think the designer was away at another location and someone said, oh, Gary, can you introduce Stephen to the, to the next set? So I turned up at the set about 7 o'clock one morning and it was this big country house. And the idea was there was a cavalry charge that were about... 50 or 60 horses that were coming from this direction. Country house there, there was a line of trees there, there was a river there with, you know, lovely foliage. And when we turned up on set, it was the thickest pea soup fog you've ever seen in your life. Oh, no. And I had to, you know, I, I was there early, I saw Stephen's car turn up. It was him and I think it was Kathy Kennedy, the producer, and they came down. And, I, and I'm standing, I, you know, couldn't see, barely see further than you across the table here. He said, so, so where's the set? And I said, well, it's here, sir. Oh, somewhere. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big country house down there and there's a tree line there and we thought maybe the horses could come from the country house. And Okay, okay. And then we had to stand there for perhaps, you know, the best part of an hour just kind of awkwardly <laughs> waiting, waiting for the fog to clear. And, yeah. you know, luckily when the fog cleared, I'd, I'd got it right and the house was in that direction hey. and the tree line was in that direction. So, phew. Oh, is that the only Spielberg thing you've worked on? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Again, that's something else you'd like to do more of? Yeah, I mean, yeah, if, he's, yeah. if he wants to make any more films in the UK, he's, <laughs> he's a great... You know, again, been very lucky with the directors I've worked with. You know, George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, mm -hmm. Luc Besson, I did The Fifth Element. Um, oh, right. I even did a little bit with Stanley Kubrick on Wide, Eyes Wide Shut. Oh. So as a sort of, you know who's who of British directors. I think I've been very lucky to have sort of crossed paths, however briefly, with, with some of the really big names. Yeah, very, very big names, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. You got, is that one last question you've had? I there? think it is. Is it this yes. one? Oh, here we go. <clears throat> this is from Scott Davey. What are the differences from working on a period film like Hope and Glory or working on a sci-fi blockbuster like Rogue One? Oh, where do I start? Big question, yes. Where do I start? <laughs> I mean, obviously, a period film, you have to be period correct. Um, so that involves a lot of research, looking through old books, old photographs, something like Hope and Glory, where obviously it's all set in wartime. This is um, a John Borman film, semi-autobiographical about his time as a kid growing up during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So I had to do a lot of a lot of research on that. We, we reproduced a whole street of typical 1930s semi-detached semi houses, so we would go around various streets and photographing windows and doors and just to make sure we, when we built the set, it was absolutely, you know, period correct. And because there's, there's always going to be one audience member that says, oh, that's wrong. You've got a plastic doorbell on that house and it was meant to be set in 1939. Yeah. It's like, so you have to be so careful with a period film. Obviously a, a, a sci-fi film like Rogue One or any of the Star Wars films, you've got a lot more leeway mm. and you can virtually anything goes although having said that because you're in the star wars universe there's a whole look there's a whole sort of vernacular of, of star wars 
world, which was kind of established originally with Ralph McQuarrie, the concept artist, Joe Johnson, before he became a, a director, he was a concept artist that worked on the original Star Wars films. And they kind of set a tone on Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back and Jedi, mm. which we then kind of inherited when we did the the sequels like um, Force Awakens, Rogue One, Solo. And we, we, we kind of, even though we had a free reign compared to doing a period film, we tried to make it in the vein of that look that was established all those years ago. Yeah. In fact, on Solo, which was the sort of backstory of Han Solo before we met him in A New Hope, the one of the sort of premises was, it was almost like working on a period movie because the premise was A New Hope was made in the 1970s and this was a prequel. So let's imagine there's a certain vernacular, a certain design that is based in the 1960s. Mm. And that manifested itself on Hans Speeder, which I was very much involved with. My, my title on that, on that job, on, on Solo, was Senior Art Director, Vehicles and Spaceships, oh. which I've still got, I've still got the, the door label in my office now because it's, like, it's the coolest credit. job title yeah. I think I've ever had. So that was quite memorable. So I was very much involved with Hans Speeder. And because we wanted to give it a kind of slightly 60s, although it's a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away and it's sci-fi and it's anything goes, the the look of the dashboard on the speed, speeder was, it, it had that kind of letter tape look that I was talking about earlier. Mm. Uh, but I also incorporated it with some sort of chrome dials, some chrome discs as if like it was a Ford Mustang from the 1960s. So that kind of look on the dashboard had a little bit of that look to it as well as the Star Wars look. Yeah. So even though it's a sci-fi blockbuster, it was still almost a period film. That's something I really like about the the modern Star Wars films. And I haven't seen all of them, but I do like that consistency <clears throat> of the vision from the, the original Absolutely. 1970s one. It, it is the same world. And Very I much love so. that the, they've kept that attention to detail. We, we've referenced a lot mm. of the early Macquarie stuff and all of that concept art from, from the original movies. We, we, we got all that out of the archive yeah. and where we could repurpose it or just be influenced by it, really, because it, it was so good. Why, why wouldn't you? Yeah, and it does look spot on. It's quite mm. incredible. Well, speaking <clears throat> of Star Wars, we have a, a short clip to play now. Uh, this is the uh, teaser trailer for Rogue One. Oh, wow. We have a mission for you. Ready? I haven't seen that in a while. It makes no. me want to go home and watch it. Yeah, I was thinking, oh gosh, that it's looks really it's cool. Out in the cinema at the moment, <laughs> yes. There's a teaser trailer there for Rogue One. Now, you mentioned that you have worked on Empire and Phantom Menace, Rogue One and Solo and The Force Awakens. Mm -hmm. you, you cross all three mm -hmm. of those mm -hmm. generations of Star Wars mm. films. Was it sort of when you go up for these, is it, oh, you were in that one? But, oh, of course no, you can come in, or no, it's not, everyone not really. is its it, own it, case. It, as I've said previously, you know, we're, we're a freelance business. You get a call. Cool are you available? Yes. Or oh, what's the project? Oh, it's a Star Wars. Oh, fine. Yeah. You know, so I don't think there was any kind of previous knowledge of my, my CV that yeah. allowed me to get on the other <laughs> ones. But um, no, it's, uh, it, it, it was lovely working on those latter films, I must say, the, the, the last three. Um, because we, we, as I said before, we, we did reference so much just in that clip, that yeah. table, you know, we had to replicate that table. Or even the looks the, of the monitors and, and the, such. All of that, yes. So, uh, yeah, really good fun. It's wonderful attention to detail <laughs> there, yes. So anything more Star Wars related coming up in the pipeline or is it very much just wait and no, see? No, I mean, that, you know, as I say, we're, we're all freelance. If, if a call comes in, then, you know, I'll obviously consider it. But at the moment, nothing, nothing in the pipeline. No. There are so many Star Wars offshoots now. Yeah, I, I almost lose track yes. with, with the different TV shows and... Mm. Um, so I've, I've done quite a few. I've 
Got it out of my system. It might be nice to do something. You've got that lovely credit at home on the wall. Yes. Exactly. Perfect. Yes. Well, let's take you back to the 1980s. Let's have another scene from Terror Hawks Mm -hmm. uh, from the second episode. This is uh, one of the the more poignant moments of the series. Zero, we are rejoining Battlehawk. I want you back on board. Sergeant Major, I don't understand. I mean, when we get back, they'll make another number 13, won't they? <laughs> you know you're in trouble, 35. You've got no art. <laughs> oh, a poignant scene there from the second episode of Terror Hawks. Is that a scene you remember being involved with at all? Yeah, vaguely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Xeroids were there constantly. That was yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's great fun characters. So where does, you know, looking back on your career, is Terror Hawks like sort of one of the, the jewels or is it a lesser thing that you're yes. still I mean, fond I, of? I think just because what we achieved with so little. Yeah. Because it, it, it's fine working on a Star Wars or a Harry Potter where you've got almost limitless budget because you, you come up with an idea and say, oh, yeah, let's do that and let's get 16 prop makers in for 10 weeks to yeah. build it. But that, if you were reliant on finding stuff that other people had thrown away that you then sprayed silver and put a red flashing light on it, then, you know, that that sort of creative uh, process, I, I, I am sort of proud that we, we achieved what we did. It was, a, you know, collaborative effort, yeah. there were a few of us there. And... Um, yeah, I mean, that, I, because every every film is different. I'm really proud of War Horse. I'm proud of Potters, proud of Star Wars, proud of Terry. They, they are so different. It's like choosing a favourite child. Yeah. <laughs> now, you've brought with you, um, to, to show us today, <clears throat> not one but three scrapbooks yes, of uh, on-set photographs from Terror Absolutely. Wars. Can we take yes. a look at those, possibly? On-set and, and some off-set, actually. Oh, yes. yes. We'll, we'll show those. <laughs> so... During during the course of the filming of, of Terror Hawks, I was always a very keen photographer and I was always there taking photographs and primarily of the sets, but also behind the scenes of the sets and people in their workshops. Because I thought, you know, one day these might actually be interesting to people. And here we are, 40 years later. I, I also also took a lot of the press cuttings when mm. when the actual um, series was announced and publicised all the... So that, that's out of the Daily, the Daily Mail, February the 15th, 1983. Wow. So Jerry, the puppet master strikes back. That's before the show aired. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of the publicity material. And then some of the... Um, creating the sets, yeah. Creating the sets. I think that's, that's the Hawkwing cockpit. That's the Hawkwing cockpit. Yeah. That's oh, the there's our size. friend uh, Terry Adlam, bottom left. There's Terry Adlam, indeed, yeah. The other, the other sets, and it shows what you were saying earlier that um, the a lot of the sets evolved over time. You Absolutely, have some very sort of simple in terms Absolutely. of the spaceship and, and yes. base sets. Very simple in the early days, and by the end, quite quite. We tried to sort of up the ante and, yeah. and get get it a little bit more. I think you were showing me earlier the interior of uh, Big White One from from First Strike. Yes, that was uh, um, a huge leap. That- compared to, say, the interior of, of Battlehawk earlier in the series. So, yes, this was, this was a quite, a nice, mm. quite a nice set. And it's great that you, could, you had a set that was so, so big now and so interesting that you could Absolutely. take pictures from so many angles. Yeah. Because some of them, it, it, in the early days, it looked like there is only one angle. There is much room here. Of course. I think you've got also um, Mrs. Dapple's house in there. Yes, well. we've got it's, it's one that we had a lot of fun doing because it was a, a very sort of domestic interior mm. with um, the flying the, ducks on the wall. It's the miniature and the plates on the, uh, the plates sideboard and, there, yes. And the fireplace, the clock. the clock. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is Peter Holmes mm. creating it from from nothing, really. Yeah. You know, I think the clock we got lucky with, that was a little miniature that we found. Oh, <laughs> They're wonderful images, little snapshots of, of moments in time that are long gone now as yes. are a lot of those um, puppets and, and props and things this is 
ah, the little circus space tent giant, I was talking yes. about. That was all very good fun. Oh. It's as I said before, it's it's these real real world sets that mm. I, I really enjoyed working yes. on. Yes. Um, you know, is there a lot of uh, like jungles and deserts and such in the early it, days? And then you of, get yes, like lots museums of and, as we have here. And that's the museum, museum with uh, yes. those statues. All the statues and mm. that's, oh, that's Pete's the, Diner. That's Pete's Diner. Yeah. Which was another really good fun thing to do. It's also interesting to see angles here that we would never see on screen. Of course. It really helps to give more of an understanding of what you were actually working with, what yes. you were up against. Because, of course, in the puppet stage, everything had to be up on a rostrum so the yeah. puppeteers could get underneath and, and in the tank on the stage and, and puppeteer. So we were always very conscious that we had to make the sets sympathetic to that way of operating. Yeah. And, of course, you have something here on the table which is uh, also <laughs> yes. from the episode Doppelganger. Some viewers may recognise this. So this is a little, again, back in the day, we didn't have the computers or Photoshop or anything. So it was, it was all, I mean, photocopiers were really high tech. We yeah. thought we'd really, we've got a photocopier, wow. So we made this little little newspaper up and, you know, the headline, Mystery at Museum, which is fine. But then you look in the, the other text and here, no pay rise for workers, <laughs> says Jerry. As a, I don't know if that's ever seen on the on the screen. I'd have no. to review the episode. That might and then, just be uh, too small to see on screen. But and this, actually, on the on the front, this is visible on the front of the the newspaper, the Daily Chronicle. It says Anderson to receive knighthood. It's about time, says ninety one year old film veteran. <laughs> so we used to have lots of little kind of in jokes like that. Which and was, he didn't mind. Of course not. No, no. that's great. No, it's, Oh, it's all it's good a, fun. All yeah, good fun. Lovely archive. And uh, I believe I'm right in saying that a lot of those <coughs> photos you, you shared with us to go on the Blu-rays, possibly? Uh, or, yes. Yes. On those. Yeah, so absolutely. So uh, any Terrorhawks fans would like to see those, most of them are on the Blu-rays, yeah. except for one or two of the... Uh, yes, the ones, the ones, ones, of, the bra ones. of the Bray Bar are yes. still... <laughs> Top secret classified. Safely, yes. in the, uh, <laughs> safely in the book itself. So any current projects in the works or anything going on recently that you'd like to tell us about? Uh, the most recent thing I've been involved with, funnily, funnily enough, is, is not, a, not a movie. Mm -hmm. It's because I worked on all the Harry Potter films. There's a very, um, a lot of the listeners may, may know the, the Harry Potter studio tour down at Leavesden. And they've been doing a little expansion recently and we've produced some new sets. Oh, lovely. So it's exactly like working on a movie, but without the film crew turning up spoiling it all so we've we've built the sets we've used the original filmmakers uh original team that built the sets 20 years ago wow for prisoner of azkaban actually and we're replicating those sets for the studio tour so oh, lovely that's something that's now open so that's been good fun yeah so it's keeping you busy absolutely yeah? but that's what we like Fantastic. So, Gary, thank you ever so much for coming in to see us. It's been wonderful to have you on the Jerry Anson podcast, sharing your memories of mm -hmm. Terror Hawks and Star Wars and others. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to see us. Thank you. Gary Tompkins. Oh, lovely. Nice for you to join us. Busy man. Yes, Chris very busy man. Yes. To... Lovely guy. Very busy. Uh, recently working on the sets for the Harry Potter experience. I think it's a leaves them, isn't it? Where they uh, it is, yeah. shot the stuff. And I think he's yeah. still involved there with designing new. Um, sets and attractions. Yeah, he's always busy. Yeah, why, why is there not a Terror Hawks experience? Well, I, I, think, I think watching Terror Hawks is a Terror Hawks experience. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Let's put it on the list. Well, we had mentioned last time of uh, from Apostle writing and with Dear Andersonians. So yes. obviously we're going to set up the Andersonian, Andersonian Museum. Yes. Museum yes. Alongside the Andercruz, of course, which I'm still uh, angry Absolutely. For. Perhaps the Andercruz can depart from uh, the, the Andersonian, Andersonian Museum. Museum. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All to wow. be set up in the next 12 months. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, now, I think it's time that we heard from our wonderful listeners and viewers, or as ah. we call them, the Podstrongs. That's right. Oh, yeah. Is it me or is it getting a bit chilly? Yeah. This is the voice of the Podstrongs. Yes, here they are, the Podstrongs. Well, no, they're not here. No, no, no. But they are they're here all, in spirit. In spirit. Yes, they're Very all much us. like uh, an alien... Uh, being put into our minds, uh, or a cat, never gonna get over or this. a ghost with a hat on. Uh, absolutely. Yes, they joined us uh, via email. They just That's sent right. in their messages at podcast.email.com. <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah, but that'll do. They know. Podcast at jerryanson.com. Right. I mean, if we had a, a mega mix of all the times you've given random email addresses out, I wonder how many people have received right. strange emails. Sorry. Okay, uh, you take the first one, Jamie. Oh, fine, Come yes. Come on, get your phone out. Um, Oh, yes. This is from Steve. Okay, great. With one E. 
Okay, Ooh. not Steve Batuli. Not Steve, but Steve. All three of these, no. Hi, guys. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, in answer to Jamie's question, is a rotor arm in a 1960s car yes. real? Uh, following on from our watch wrong with the protectors. Mm. Yes, because I was just sometimes they, people make up the technical things, yes. even on simple They did that a few times things. in the protectors. Ah, they can't yeah. follow us, we've taken the rotor arm. Well, my question is answered. The long answer is... Oh, yeah. Yes. That's Hooray. the long answer. Yes. And now, here's the longer oh, answer. Oh, the technical <laughs> answer. It's the rotating electrical high tension contact of the distributor and is part of the distributor cap, often used as the earliest form of engine immobilizer. Uh, as my dad, when he was alive, had minis, and when he parked them up at home for the night, would often take out the rotor arm oh. and bring it indoors with him, thus rendering the vehicle useless to would-be car oh, thieves. Or so it was actually like an immobilizer that you would utilize. That is you, amazing. You I love the stuff that we learn on this podcast. Yeah, it's not always Anderson related. Sometimes it's you know mechanical. Yeah. So now, if I ever inherit a 1960s mini, yeah. I'll know how to immobilize <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. I just have to find the rotor arm yeah, first. Just give it yourself away a bit there. Oh. Yeah. yeah, just if you want to steal my mini, just bring a rotor <laughs> on with you. <laughs> uh, Simpsons Clips 24 says, Hello, Richard, Jamie, and Chris. Simpsons Clips 24 here. Mm. We knew that because I'd already just You'd already pre yeah, that, yeah. Uh, I'd like to congratulate you for getting Kate Harbour on the podcast. Oh, yes. that, that was lovely. Totally congratulations to well, you. Was it you? Uh, possibly, it was yes, you. I'm not the guest. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With that in mind, I've got a few suggestions for Lavender Castle related guests oh, that I you could get in touch with. Uh, have you tried getting, brackets, deep breath? Jimmy Hibbert, Rob Rackstraw, Brian Cosgrove, Chris Trengove, Barry Purvis, or even Rodney Matthews. Gosh, How did I do? What a tongue well twister. Uh, SIG, Simpsons Clips 24. Yeah, well, I'll give you 3.5 out of 5. Yeah, Thanks yeah, very I'll, much. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a 3. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, well, Simpsons Clips 24, I'm just going to say that keep your eyes and ears peeled. Ooh. One of those names will be joining us on the Jerry Anderson podcast <gasps> if all goes to plan. Oh, Ooh. that's what I'll say. If Only things one go to plan. Yeah, and yes. 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 They've, they've responded. They're very excited. The date's in the diary. <laughs> but yes. we, know, we know things have changed. We've had that before. We have. Yes. But as we stand, one of those names will be joining us. Yes. But Kate was lovely. Chris, you have an email for us. I do. I do. I do. I have an email. It's here. I've got it. It's from Alex in Suffolk. Hello, everyone. Oh, hello. Hello, Alex Hi, in Suffolk. Spurred on by Talking Pictures TV's recent repeats of Fireball XL5, I've been going through my Fireball XL5 DVDs, oh. Oh. digging out my memorabilia, and yes, pre-ordering the new XL5 technical manual. Oh, yes. I've also been watching your previous XL5 related YouTube videos and was horrified to learn that okay. the beloved Robert the Robot was destroyed and therefore replaced by Robert 2 in the pages of TV21. Yes, yeah. this is going back a bit in the Fab Facts yeah. world. Yeah. In light of Fireball XL5's current renaissance, can we please all agree that Robert 2 must have been made from at least some of Robert 1's reclaimed parts, especially his identity and personality circuit? Mm. However, undynamic a personality. Yeah, personality Thank you, and all the best. Alex from right, Suffolk. Suffolk. Yes. Okay. Well, well, I mean, that's the. the should, we, should we agree it now? I can agree. I'll agree, agree that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I propose. Second. Second. Uh, uh, third. Yeah, third. Yeah, motion's yeah, passed. Motion passed. Great. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yep. Just pass the motion. Yes. Uh, good. <laughs> interesting. So, uh, interesting that he watches Fireball XL5 on Talking Pictures TV and then heads straight to his DVD to watch more Fireball XL5. Well, uh, Talking Pictures, they show these shows in blocks of 13. Wow. So he, they've they've stopped at episode 26 I for see. a while. He might have had a hankering to continue. Yes. You know, it's, yeah, it's, right. a, it's a problem you have. Yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, all for now. Podstrons, mm. you know the deal. Get in touch with us. Podcast at jns.com. It's really easy. You write something, we read it out. I thought you were going to go into a long explainer. Of I can if you want. No, no, that's absolutely fine. No, You're really. all, we're all clear on how to send an email, yeah? Yes. 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 300 something pods in. Yep. I think they've got it. Oh, yep. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll uh, be hearing from you next time. Uh, but in the meantime, let's uh, head back to Gary Tonkins. <gasps> oh, see yes. See if he can press the button for the randomizer, randomizer. for this week's episode. Oh, yeah. What will he pick? Here we go. Three, two, one. Uh, I quite fancy something live action after four minutes of all last week. Like maybe Space 1990. I'd like something a bit more obscure, a bit more out there. Okay. Okay. 
just something with the opposite end of the run. Ooh, ah, just yes. like that. That's yes, great. Nice. Couldn't get more opposite to four for the falls, really. Absolutely. In time, anyway. You cut in Scarlet. Mm, 2005. Scarlet. Yeah. Do you? Yeah, I do. I, I like it. Mm. Now, the, what I'm about to say is quite controversial. Uh oh. Oh no. I prefer the CGI characters and design more than I prefer Super Mario Nation. Gosh. Design. I, I can immerse myself more easily in computer generated effects and characters than I can mm. in the laboratory. Well, which is you've just that's lost 52% of the audience. I know, I know, I know. And that's fine though, isn't it? That's of course fine. it is. Yeah. Can I say, I see where you're coming from and I don't entirely disagree. Oh, okay, so oh, I think when, it comes, indeed. when it comes to Captain Scarlet, it yeah. is never an issue of Old one is perfect, new one is blah, blah, blah. No, no. It's like they're both equally valid. And Good. They've both got strengths and weaknesses. Oh, I feel I'm on safer ground now. Yeah, you are on safe ground. So tell us a little bit about New Captain Scarlet. Well, New Captain Scarlet is a remake of Captain Scarlet, made using CGI, as you said. Uh, in 2000, and it was produced in 2004, aired in 2005 on ITV, um, and it was Jerry Anderson's final series. Mm -hmm. 26 episodes, reimagining the, the whole world of Captain Scarlet from the original series yeah. with um, new takes on all the old characters. All right. And yeah, Mr. Ron's still being naughty. Shall we see how it gets on? <laughs> still being naughty. Guys. Can't wait to see how naughty they oh, are in this one. So <laughs> naughty. Specs on. Earth is at war with an alien civilization. The Nisterons can kill anyone and rebuild them as instruments of their war against us. Well, there's a shot from the episode we're about to watch. Ah. Yes. It's a very dynamic opening, isn't it? It is, yes. You are virtually indestructible. Yeah, I like it. I like it already. I've never seen it before, I'd like it already. Would you? I'd be in, I'd be hooked. Oh, for sure. Well, that's convenient for this. Yes, we open with Scarlet and Destiny, uh, everyone's favourite romantic couple. Yes. <laughs> uh, off on a break somewhere, doing a bit of mountain climbing. Yeah. Can't remember where this is, but I'm sure they'll tell us. I told you it'd be fun. <laughs> it's quite fun to imagine all the actors doing their motion capture yeah. movements. You have a weird idea of fun. <laughs> oh, come on, Paul. You've got to agree it's worth the effort. Look at that view. Beautiful. Couldn't have done that shot in Classic Scarlet, could you? Yeah, oh. to uh, What's this? A new toy? His futuristic tech as imagined from 2005. <laughs> and already it looks more anachronistic than <laughs> yeah. anything yeah. from UFO. <gasps> Oh yeah, it has a hyper, super duper, blinding flash on it. Yes, even in crazy daylight yeah. levels of sun. <laughs> At night, it's got an incredible flash. Ah. Yeah, we noticed. I suspect that might come in useful later. Oh, yes. Well, so it's strange. Instead of a Chekhov's gun, it's a Scarlet's flash. <laughs> yes. Yes. Do you think, Jamie? Which way round did it go? Was it uh, Jerry wanted to make a CGI series? Let's make Captain Scarlet. Or was it I want to remake Captain Scarlet? Let's make it CGI. Um, that's an interesting theoretical because he wanted to he wanted to remake Thunderbirds, mm. but uh, the powers that be at the time wouldn't let him. Right. Um, so they pushed and pushed and pushed. And eventually, they did an option agreement for Scarlet, uh, which seemed to be the most most likely second candidate. But he was always fascinated with whatever the latest tech was. Yeah. And, and yeah. CG and motion capture was you know building in its use and how impressive it was. So. I think they probably just came in hand, hand in hand. I, I, yeah. don't, I don't think he ever intended for it to be uh, Super Mario Nation. Yeah. You know, he was done with all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, CG was the natural method. I think there was, you know, they were looking at <clears throat> potential for live action too. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, CG won out. Of course, they did the uh, CG test film with um, Ed Bishop and Francis yeah. Matthews, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Destiny. Destiny has been uh, selected oh. to go somewhere and do something. It's yes. a big honour, apparently, yeah, but apparently I can't remember so. what it was. Yeah. Right, yeah, she's top of the list. Yeah, but here's a, so a the very aggressive driver. It is. Yeah. The physics of the cars, uh, a lot of vehicular stuff, 
was the one thing that I feel kind of really ages New Scarlet now. That there's no weight to them. Yeah, yeah. it's a shame. The design is lovely though, isn't oh, it? Oh yeah, lovely it's design. A, and some great shots. In and they did some great stuff when, when it's ice and the, uh, the, the big tanks, right. that sort of stuff. Yeah. They, were, they were pretty impressive, yeah. they felt more weighty. So the guy Destiny forced off the road. He's gone. Huh. That's a suspicious green glow yeah, in that yes. car. Ah, yeah. uh -oh. oh, there he is. Oh. But never mind. It's brought us together again. Mm. Oh. And there's something I need you to do for me. Yes, Black and Destiny were uh, an item before the series started. Oh, yep. And then by the end of the first episode, pretty much she'd said, I'm with Scarlet instead. And that was that. Gosh. Every so often we get a bit of uh, thrown together again. Bit of tension. Black and Destiny angst, yeah. yes. Okay, so she's arrived at... Was she wearing white before and now she's yes. wearing black? Is that Ooh, symbolic it somehow? Could be, couldn't yes. it? Mm. Some attention to detail there. Yeah. Here she's at International Defence Headquarters. Yes. Nice flags. Now, I, I detect the sort of influence here from various spy films and shows <laughs> mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah. I'm thinking like Mission Impossible yeah, yeah. and things like Minority Report, maybe. Um, what else would have been a influence here? Well, probably some Bond stuff going on there, yeah. I suspect. And that guard, much like the old uh, puppet shows, this show would reuse CGI figures. How bizarre. Mm. So this guy might get killed this week. Yes. He'll be back next week as someone else, which right. is kind of fun. Because he existed in the sort of the... In the... As a, just a model, just like, yeah. Like, yeah. just like a puppet would, yeah. yeah. Just on the digital shelf. Well, there were several uh, CGI versions of your dad in this show, aren't there? Indeed, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, is there a CGI version of you in here anywhere? I don't believe so. No. <laughs> no. I don't Missed think I have the honour. <laughs> Got to get through the uh, window first. Oh yeah, this is I mean, it's interesting you say that you know he really wanted to get Thunderbirds back off the ground again mm. in some form. And of course, that was not to be. But to my mind, if there was going to be one series that would lend itself to CGI, I think it would be Captain Scarlet. Yeah. Strangely, I agree. It's a nice novel way to do a window rather it's than just good, slicing it? through it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> Peeling it away. Yeah. Very clever. Oh, and now, talking to Mission Impossible. Mm, yeah. I've got the slightly bongos on the soundtrack here. And all the great sound effects of her whooshing around as yes. she does her moves. There we go. <laughs> and back. <laughs> I've never understood um, if this, this sort of red laser beam security technology is as prevalent as TV shows and films would make mm. us believe that it is. Mm. I would suspect if it is there, it's probably totally invisible rather than... Yes. And also, they don't seem terribly effective. No. They seem to have t turned off the moment she stepped outside as well. <laughs> yeah, so. yes. People always seem to get around them, don't they, in these yeah. programmes? But she's got what she needed. Which is... Which is something important from the safe. I <laughs> Four I'm little things in a box, yes. it looks like. That's a good bit of tech as well. Oh, it's a long way down. Oh, and the flag! <laughs> <laughs> Boing! Oh, oh nice. Uh, that's very uh, golden eye, isn't it? Mm. Oh. Your hands in the air and don't move. Ah, you'll get a bonus for this. What are you talking about? This is an exercise designed to test security. I'll show you my authorization. Ooh. It's called a foot Authorize and a fist <laughs> and the butt of your gun and oh. let's cave your skull in for good measure. Gosh. <sighs> so oh, this is not the Destiny Angel that we know and love, clearly. Wow. Doesn't seem to be. Uh, could I have a Big Mac uh, fries and a uh, Diet Coke, please? <laughs> <sighs> Oh no! That's a good dying one. act. Emergency yeah. belt button. Yeah. It's a security emergency. You'll have to wait, I'm afraid, until I get the all clear. <laughs> until I get the all clear. <laughs> it's some kind of emergency. I don't right. pay him no mind. 
Ah, but he's forgetting that this is a car that can fly. Oh, kind of. Fantastic. Yes. Ah, I love the uh, the lights going down the middle there. That's yeah. really nice. There's oh. something else this show did very well in terms of locations was like power plants and, oh, and yeah. secret bases and such. Yeah. Lots of great oh. industrial design. We come back here. The yep. Uh, pretty lady. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh. Yes. 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 I mean, the just because he's the heroic Captain Scarlet doesn't make that weird perving okay. No. <laughs> oh, he's he's got a bit of a lovey dovey thing. Yeah. He's, yeah, but a bit weird. If we, we came in here and Richard was there with his feet up, looking at a yeah. slideshow of Charlotte on the monitor. I mean, he's just as well he weren't here half an hour early this morning. <laughs> Particularly as these are the last line of defence between us and the aliens that want to destroy us. Yeah. Where is he? Oh, he's uh, yeah. looking at some pictures. Okay, thank you. I've got the full thing. You can go now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. But remember, Herr Janus, I will need your remarkable services again, so make sure you keep our little arrangement strictly to yourself. Oh, Herr Janus. Your family will have a very nasty accident. Oh, what a threat. Oh, yes. Wow. Lovely facial animation as well. He's a real, he's a real smarmy, smarmy villain. Yeah, lots of lip curling. What are you going to do with those launch codes? Or launch codes? Yeah. After all the trouble I've been to, what do you mean? Uh, <sighs> welcome back. Uh, uh, not the real destiny. Uh, My associate, Gina Martinelli. Impressed? Um, mm. So creepy. Effect. This isn't the usual Mistrons taking over. No, no. This is uh, this is a terrifying uh, looking device. Apparently, the invention of hair Janus, which is another golden eye connection. Yeah, yeah, right. Yes. But not only is it a switch of face, it's a switch of voice actress as well. I think. There. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that Gina hasn't been quite herself recently. Wow. Very intense look there. Yep, it's definitely not there. I just can't believe it. What other explanation is there? The this window is ruined. <laughs> we'll have to buy another one. Believe the chief. Then look at this. One of the security. Does that window just remain like that for the rest of the series? <laughs> Probably. Oh. Well, that's a nasty thing to slip into the script. The injured guard may never recover. The Mysterons have got her now. Yeah. Oh, he looks all He's sad. So sad. Look at his sad little face. Oh, yeah. Oh, he should be warm. <laughs> he brought a pizza. I just changed the radiator. Yeah. How am I supposed to eat like this? I'll feed you. Oh, salt, <laughs> creepy, pepper. Yes, it's a very sinister, slightly twisted relationship these two have now. Yeah. The missile launch codes. So Captain Black is operating on behalf of the Mistrons. Or is he just oh, doing yeah. nasty things because he's Captain Black? Well, he was of Spectrum. He was a good guy. Then the Mistrons got hold of him. Now he's bad. We don't know if they control him or mm. how much of him is left inside. It's a uh, one of the questions this series asks that the original didn't. Uh -huh. She knows how to drive a Spectrum car. Oh, oh Scarlet. I was never quite taken with the, um, the, the shape of the helmets on the bike. I, there's something about them just seems a bit, a bit strange. But <clears> somewhere <throat> around here on this street set, there is a sign. There it is. Just behind Scarlet. Smoking kills. And that's that. And that's that. Yeah. 
which is a long way from, I remember in the original Scarlet, there's a city scene where there is some, I think it's cut out of a magazine, some smoking adverts <laughs> on the, on the right. wall. So, yeah. <laughs> Scarlet's found the secret lab of Herr Janus. Destiny. What's going on, Destiny? Oh, hang That's on. not the real Destiny, is it? She's, she's, in, black. she's in black, yeah. Get away. Oh. oh. There we go. What the? Surprise. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was a surprise. <laughs> Oh dear, this took there a long time. Yes. <laughs> yes. Four hours later. <laughs> Little establishment is an artist and a genius. He has developed this extraordinary <gasps> technique. What the hell do you want? <clears throat> Not everyone's as indestructible as you, Scarlet. <sighs> okay. Oh, and here we come up on a very nasty moment. And I'll be on my way. Ah yes, the green stuff. I have some green stuff for you. <gasps> oh. oh yes. Green stuff. No blood on the Yeah. Versus, uh, yeah, look, there oh, they are. the green stuff. Gosh. I remember um, when I interviewed Crispin Merrill for the podcast, he was, we were talking about this scene in particular. He was showing his daughter, he was introducing his daughter to the series, yeah. and his wife was a bit concerned that maybe it was a bit too, too adult for her. No, no, it's fine. No, it's fine. And then he started watching the scene with her and he heard his music building up to that moment <laughs> that he hadn't thought about in years. And he thought, ah, yeah. maybe I should uh, avert her eyes for a moment. Detonate this mine in Skybase's future. Okay, so now she is Mr. Skybase. Oh, yes. Yeah. Along with everyone on board. But I remember reading an interview with your dad where he said that the question of violence was... Some broadcasters were like, oh, no, 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 no. And mm. some, I think the Japanese were like, more blood, more gore. W was that something you were aware of? That there was uh, yeah, they were, they were constantly struggling with stuff and getting scripts approved mm. by ITV, I think, and by CITV. Um, and then I think when, even when they got the distributors on, distributors then went, oh, well, this is going to be difficult for America because of sort of how violent it is. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's so tricky to make a kid's show was that is more so now in this kind of age bracket where you're mm. kind of going for eight to adult. Yeah, that doesn't exist. There are you know just streaming would allow it now. There are, mm. there are mo loads more streaming things that would be watched by kids that are much more violent. Yeah, but at that time when it was broadcast only slots because that is a, a full on execution and yet there is no blood. Yeah, which. I always wondered if it was if it was meant to be more than it is. It's probably. still shocking, but yeah, probably yeah. But no blood would be a no no for, no for selling it anywhere. So now Gina can, or well, Black can see through Gina's eyes. Oh, another Anderson trope there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everyone thinks she's Destiny. So that she's actually a cat. <laughs> Captain Scarlet, Destiny. What brings you here? Sorry, it's classified. Colonel, Scarlet and Destiny are entering fuel storage. Fuel storage? Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Alert all our captains. Use their... Per this is not a part of the series where we have other captains. There are no other captains at this point in the series. We don't even have Captain Blue this week. Yeah. But we're alerting all the other captains who won't appear. Yes. Uh, it's a very sparsely populated episode, this one. Yeah. Oh, no. Especially as we've shot all our regular technician extras. Bomb active. Oh dear. Detonation imminent. How long until detonation? <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to say. In 30 seconds. Would you like to say goodbye? Come on. It's quite tense. Mm. Yeah, it is. They were good at doing tense stuff. Scarlet! You'll kill us all! Keep back. That's the idea. It'll be bullets next time. But again, this would work better if that was, say, blue. Sort of like, no, yeah, Scarlet, sure. don't do it. Why but wasn't it? I don't know. I think this is the only episode he's not in, yeah. randomly. Ah, there it is coming into play. The old the flash, flash on the camera, yes. It's not the detonation. It's okay. I've shot Destiny in the head. <laughs> Everyone, it's fine. That was so good. I think we should see it again, don't you? Oh, we could tag that onto the end of the podcast. 
Now, that was the there moment when the mine exploded. Ooh. And this is when Gina, Scarlet, and Skybase were destroyed. Um, well... <laughs> Presumptuous of you, yes. Captain Mark. Another good day's work on my part. <laughs> Don't tell me you're going to keep your word and release me. In keeping with what you said about it, it must be fun to watch the... Uh, the voice actors, or the, the physical actors doing the acting out the stuff. Emma Tate must have had uh, a day of just going. Oh no. Uh oh. Oh! oh. <laughs> that was a great little technique. Oh, yeah. get him, go. Oh. Nice. She's cramming all the action heroine tropes into uh, yep. a few minutes. Yeah. There was a door right next to that window. Yes. She had no time <laughs> to open it. Eddie's pizza next, though. Yeah. Could have had a snack on the way out. Albatross. Uh huh. This is Scarlet. Yeah. Being dropped off in the rhino. Nice that they've sort of set it in the. the the dying light of evening. Mm. It's a nice change. Wow. Oh, she's wearing white, so it's all fine. Is it fine Stop. then? Stop. Keep well, your distance. Wait. Paul, you're alive. Black saw what he wanted to see. The explosion was just a camera flash. And the well, even if there had been an explosion, he'd still be alive afterwards in I some form. Yes. Admitting to complete the illusion. Stay where you are. Oh. I'm not a Mr. On. Will there be a slightly sickly line at the end between Ooh, yes. the two of them? You once told me that every time you've been near a Mr. On, you feel lousy. Did I? I don't. That's an original serious thing, Destiny. I never <laughs> said that to you. <laughs> you must be a Mr. On. <laughs> Good. I feel good. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> like I knew that I would. No, no cheesy line. No. The well, feel good was a bit cheesy. Aww. Yeah. No. Look at that. Nice drone shot. Oh, there goes the <laughs> trust. Fantastic. Yeah, that's it. Skin deep. That's yeah. the end. Yeah. Very All good. Down. I like it a lot. Well, How successful was it at the time? Do you know? It wasn't successful at all, was it? Because of the scheduling. Yeah. No, it didn't um, get the exposure it needed, unfortunately. No. People who watched it enjoyed it, but unfortunately there weren't enough people who knew that it was even on, yeah. so that was that. Yeah. Yeah, great shame. Yeah. A crime, almost. But it's a good one for your dad's career to end on, in a way, in that it's mm. a quality piece of work. Oh, absolutely, absolutely yeah. yeah. That's a nice thing. And a great team of people doing doing the best best work at the time. It was, you know, pioneering, groundbreaking stuff. Mm. And people will watch it now and go, hmm. Oh. CG's not very good. Yes. Not realising that. People are watching know. it still and enjoying it still. And they yeah. absolutely are. Yeah. Yeah. You do right. get the people saying, oh, it was made in computer, it only took two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm. what do you think, Skin Deep, New Captain Scarlet? Where well, are you going, Chris? Good. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm going to say 2. Uh, point wow! Eight. That's pretty. Eight points. That's pretty. I mean, I'm I'm just, just into the lower half of the series, just because there's so much good stuff in the second half that it's like two point eight. That's quite low. Well, yeah, out of five, I'm going to go a big four for that. Okay. Big four. I really enjoyed it. I yeah. thought it was quite tense. I love the uh, the interplay between uh, um, uh, Black and and Destiny, uh, and I also like the, uh, the the double the double gang story. Yeah, it's yeah. quite, uh, quite good. I'm in between at 3.5. Oh, I did enjoy ooh, it, yeah. but there's, okay. there's a few things that are kind of unresolved, right. a bit odd. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure of. It does. The, it is one of those episodes that might benefit from having been made later, mm. when there you you'd have a busier looking city, you'd have more characters. It, it feels quite small scale. Yeah. Which I suppose works to a certain extent. Yeah. But yeah. It's still very it's still good. Yeah. Any episode of New Captain Scarlet is a rollicking good time. Yeah.
Quite right too. What do you think, yeah. Podstrons? Do you agree with us? Would you rate it higher or lower? Let us know in the comments or emails at podcast at jerryamerson.com. Mm. You got it right. I got it right. Yay. Well done, right. you. Yeah, nice change. Uh, I hope you're going to join us next week because I think we should get together and do pretty much more of the same. <laughs> oh, more gosh, of the same. really? Yeah. That would mean yeah. another interview, yeah. some more Jerry Anderson news, mm. uh, some more emails from our Podstrons, yeah. and another episode of the Randomizer to see how it Yes. Oh, great. Do you that sounds really nice. See, that's, a, that's a plan. Brilliant. See you then. Bye. Bye. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. You just cut Ross, that Ross, before we do bands. No, carry on, mate. You <laughs> carry on. That was an Anderson Entertainment production. <laughs>